According to NSA whistleblower Bill Binney, the government has collected as many as 20 trillion emails and phone calls belonging to Americans. So what this means is the NSA is essentially a backup server for the nation's entire store of communications, both over the phone and the internet. So if you email the photo, say, of your pug dog's first bath, well, the NSA may have that photo somewhere in its database. And now that we're all finally becoming aware of the NSA's surveillance and storage capabilities, questions are arising about who should have access to this trove of data and how it should be used. For example, in Florida, a man suspected of bank robbery is demanding that the NSA turn over any phone records it may have on him to prove that he was nowhere near the location of the robbery he's accused of committing. After all, it's against the law for prosecutors to withhold evidence that could prove the innocence of a defendant. But the government claims it doesn't have the particular phone call information and that even if it did, it would be classified information and thus the defendant wouldn't be allowed to see it anyway. So the NSA so far is unwilling to go on a fishing expedition through its records to find what could be exonerating evidence for defendants. But they are more than happy to hand over what could be incriminating evidence to appropriate law enforcement agencies. According to one of the latest Edward Snowden leaks published by The Guardian on Thursday, the NSA's own grammatical error-ridden guidelines used to minimize data collection on American citizens say, quote, a communication identified as a domestic communication will be destroyed upon recognition unless the director of the NSA specifically determines the communication does not contain foreign intelligence information but is reasonably believed to contain evidence of a crime. Such communication may be disseminated, including United States person identities, to appropriate federal law enforcement authorities. Again, I don't know why there's so many errors in that statement. But the key thing here is, notice how the document doesn't say evidence of a crime of terrorism or evidence of a threat to national security or anything. It just says evidence of a crime. So let's say you text your friend who may have had too much to drink the night before to make sure he drove home safe. That could be evidence of the crime of drunk driving and thus the NSA can keep that text message. Or let's say you're organizing a protest against, I don't know, the NSA's surveillance operations and you send an email with plans to stage a sit-in in the street at the NSA headquarters. That's technically illegal, so the NSA can keep that email too. Not only that, it can hand over this information to the FBI, and the FBI can do with it whatever it likes. But again, evidence held by the NSA that might prove you're innocent of a crime, that's top secret. You can't have that. Now, this is really important. We've been told all along that these surveillance programs are aimed at foreign individuals in the name of national security. But collecting data on American citizens that could implicate them in crimes ranging from jaywalking to drunk driving to civil disobedience seems to have no bearing whatsoever on national security. And instead, it seems to be just another tool for law enforcement to slant our criminal justice system away from the accused and toward the accuser. And for those who say this sort of surveillance doesn't bother them because they're not doing anything wrong, just remember, there are thousands and thousands of laws on the books, and evidence that you may have broken any one of them is enough to get your email and your phone calls put in the NSA's massive database. In Washington, Sam Sachs, RT.